Hello and welcome to part two of this course called The Dialectics of God. Now for many of you it's part one because I took a, an, a lecture that I gave a few weeks ago uh, that was a one-off lecture on a publication from 1966, the Time Magazine article that came out uh, with the title, Is God Dead? And that magazine article uh, was a moment in which two lines met which is interesting, there was the line of a, a radical academic theological idea and there was the popular world. And at this moment in 1966, these lines crossed and there was this brief moment where um, radical theology became very, very popular. And this, this, this magazine article in a way symbolizes that moment. And so last uh, few weeks ago, I gave that seminar and it was actually while giving that seminar that I thought, you know what, I would like to take a little bit more time and go a little bit deeper. And so that's become the first part of this five part series. So what I did last uh, in the last part is basically uh, you all got a copy of the magazine and uh, we read it to try to get into the mindset and the mentality of what was going on in the 60s with this notion of radical theology. And I touched on the notions of the death of God, the death of God happening, happening objectively uh, in really the 17th century. And by objectively, we looked at what that means, which is that God ceased to be a hypothesis that was required for economics, for ethics, for physics, chemistry, biology. Right? Before that, God was still uh, an important part of understanding the world uh, and studying the world. But what happened uh, with the Enlightenment uh, was that these sciences uh, began to be able to make progress without the hypothesis of God. So that was a type of death of God in the objective historical world. And then we looked at how these death of God theologians also talk about uh, the death of God subjectively. And what they are referring to is really the 19th and 20th century where uh, a lot of people um, in Europe especially uh, experienced a type of meaninglessness to life. And we're talking about two world wars, we're talking about the Holocaust, uh, as well as the growth of psychology, psychoanalysis um, to explain the inner world. But we're talking about a time in which um, people experienced a profound sense of nihilism. And of course, not everybody experienced that, uh, but you see it in the kind of the art of the generation. The high point of the literature, of the theatre, of the music was expressing this type of existential meaninglessness. And that wasn't the case prior to the 19th century. Um, there will be individuals who experienced that, but in terms of the epoch, in terms of uh, the, the general milieu of an age, uh, previously it was guilt. <clears throat> uh, for a lot of people, um, their inner world was one in which they felt that they weren't living up to something. And you can see this in relation to someone like Luther. Uh, Luther's appeal was connected with his ability to address the guilt that he felt profoundly in his, in his subjectivity, but that actually spoke to a whole generation of people. But with, with the 19th and 20th century, we see this experience that more and more people have in which they feel an anxiety in, in life. Uh, Paul Tillich writes beautifully about this. He speaks of it in his book, The Courage to Be. And, um, you know, we can think of the French existentialists as the probably the the, uh, the best example of that feeling. Um, so that's what we did in the last uh, seminar, uh, in the first part of this course. We looked at that magazine. Uh, we looked at this notion of the death of God in uh, the historical world objectively and in our existential experience. Uh, now I want to go a little bit deeper and we're gonna get uh, stuck into the book. It's actually just beyond my reach, so I can't get it. But the death of God that was uh, called Radical Theology and the Death of God, that was published in the same year as the Time magazine. Uh, 
It was also published the same year as Thomas Altizer's The Gospel of Christian Atheism. So this is the moment for radical theology. This is, let's call them Generation One, right? Generation One is in the 1960s. There is a, a group of writers who can broadly be categorized under this term radical theology. And this is the moment in which the public uh, takes an interest. Uh, uh, William Hamilton says that it was a, an interest that was neither desired nor deserved, uh, but it was an interest nonetheless. And uh, perhaps actually it was the worst thing that could have happened to the movement. But uh, for a few years, uh, all eyes were on this uh, group of death of God theologians. And they were being talked about in coffee shops, in bars, on buses. They were getting uh, auditoriums full of people at their events. They were selling books, bestsellers. Uh, this is the last probably time where a theological movement has been part of uh, the public intellectual movement. You know, so it captured the imagination of the public. And uh, this book is uh, written by Altizer and Hamilton. Uh, it's a series of essays that they wrote that's kind of compiled together. And my guess is uh, it's compiled together because this movement was just blowing up and as quickly as possible, they were pulling together resources that already existed into something that could be sold. Because the book itself uh, kind of reads a little bit like that. It's kind of all over the place, but it's also a, a wonderful place to start for trying to understand what radical theology is and that is what I want to do because to be honest with you it's there's very little out there that explains it uh, there's very little out there that it gives you a good introductory course to these ideas that gives you the tools to really enter into them uh, I'll give you a few reasons why I think that is uh, and then I want to give you the goals that I have for this course uh, and then you know we'll, we'll get stuck in so firstly, why is there not much in terms of good introductions to radical theology? Now that's beginning to change. Uh, there are some writers today, people like uh, uh, Chris Rodkey, uh, Jeff Robbins, and others who are writing very good secondary pieces on this movement. But um, there's still not very much. You know, most big movements they have a small group of primary writers, very difficult thinkers who are doing the, the difficult task of uh, working with their innovation. And then you have a whole host of academics and popularizers who come up and they make sense of this work, they make it more accessible, um, they make it more palatable, and they vulgarize. And Vulgarise sounds like such a terrible word now, but to vulgarise simply means to put in the common tongue. And so this tradition of vulgarising philosophy uh, is a venerable one. And that uh, they're the vulgarizers of any movement like existentialism, like post-structuralism, whatever. But we're the vulgarizers of the death of God theology. Um, Weirdly, it's probably because it blew up so quickly and then it disappeared, it went underground so fast, that it didn't create a whole generation of students who did all of this kind of uh, expository work. And so for a long time it just went dormant. Uh, there are some exceptions. There's a book that uh, John Cobb uh, brought together with a variety of academics that's out there that I link to uh, as part of this course. But broadly speaking, you're kind of left with the big thinkers uh, and not many people who are making them accessible. And one of the reasons why primary thinkers of a movement are a nightmare to read is because they don't even have the clarity of what they're doing in the midst of doing it. It often requires somebody to come along after the fact and begin to make sense of what they're doing, of, of linking things together, like how does this person's first book connect with their last book? Uh, is there a thread or is there a break in their thinking? Um, the actual person who's writing, they're not generally thinking like that. Maybe at the end of their life, they will have a good summary of what they've been doing and real clarity. And if you're lucky, a, a first rate thinker will at the end of their life, write a book that offers an introduction to their entire work.
Uh, an example might be Paul Tillich, whose very last seminars uh, in a small book called My Search for Absolutes. It doesn't give a, you know, it doesn't give an overview of, of the complexity of Tillich's work or anything like that, but it's a very beautiful short book that gets to the heart of what Tillich has probably always been doing in, in every single uh, book that he's written. Um, but, you know, often a, a thinker doesn't get the chance to do that. Uh, we don't generally get to choose when we die, uh, even if it's my intention at the end of my life to write a summary of how to read my work and see the links. Um, uh, it's hard to do that. I might write it and then live for another 10 years <laughs> or, or uh, not get to write it. So you've got that problem. Um, secondly, there's a lot of diversity within what is called radical theology. And we're going to touch on that in a second because it's in the preface of this book that I want to look at. But there's a lot of diversity. So, you know, the question is, what, what really is a radical theologian? Um, uh, what qualifies as that definition? And then thirdly, I wrote these down. Um, oh yeah, it's difficult. I think, I think that's what, my, I can't even read my own writing. Um, but I think, uh, I said the third thing is that the ideas are difficult. These are difficult writers to read, particularly Thomas Altizer, who is the, really the greatest of, the, of generation one. Right. He is the, the most innovative, the most far reaching, uh, has the grandest vision of all the radical theologians. And in some respects, this course is a way to delve into his particular work. William Hamilton is another of the very important thinkers at the time, uh, but his work uh, isn't as innovative, isn't as uh, interesting. Um, it's, it's much simpler. Uh, but the great thing about Hamilton is he's a great writer. He's a very clear writer and he can really help us uh, get clarity about what, what Altizer is doing. Uh, Thomas Altizer, by the way, just died in November 2018 uh, at the age of 91. Uh, and he died in relative obscurity. Quite near the end of his life, because of the work of Slavio Šizek, he came into the academic light a little bit. But really from the 70s right through to you know, 2010 or whatever, uh, he was sidelined by the academy. Uh, he was teaching literature. And um, uh, the question remains really whether he will be seen as an important figure in the 20th century. Uh, I think he should be. Uh, John Cobb, who's a very, very important uh, theologian, thinks that uh, Altizer and radical theology was the most innovative type of theology in the 20th century next to process theology, which is what John Cobb does. I would just reverse that. I think process uh, thought is probably the most innovative theological stuff that came out of the 20th century, except for <laughs> radical theology. Um, but you know, he has not had the attention that he deserves, uh, except for that brief moment in the 60s. Mm. But my job is to make it clear. And if I do my job well, that's going to happen. So my goals are, one, that you're going to have an overview of radical theology. That by the end of this course, you're going to understand broadly what that is about, what they're doing. Uh, two, um, oh yeah. Secondly, I want to try to hint at how it is being reinvigorated today and why it might be the... Uh, theology of the future of the 21st century. That's what I believe, and that's what I work uh, to see happen. And pyrotheology is a form of radical theology. Uh, we won't get too deep into the connections and the differences, I don't think, um, necessarily, but I, I do want to hint at that. I do want to talk about a little bit of pyrotheology, what I'm trying to do, how it relates to radical theology. And then thirdly, I want to give you the tools so that you can read these thinkers for yourself, because they are difficult, particularly Altizer. He's not an easy person to read, but we're actually going to read him. You're going to be reading a couple of essays by Altizer, and they're probably some of the clearest essays you've got. So with reading him directly and with what I'm speaking about, uh, I'm hoping that by the end of this course, you can, uh, if you want, dive a little bit deeper. And if you don't, you can at least say, I've got a good grasp of what this thing radical theology is. In fact, last time I looked, there wasn't even a Wikipedia article about death of God or radical theology. 
Now, that might be changed, I haven't looked up recently, but I think it was a year or two ago that I looked it up and um, was surprised that there wasn't even like an entry in Wikipedia. So that's how uh, unknown it is. Uh, and it's very, very misunderstood as well. Okay, so let's get started. Mm. The first thing I wanna talk about very briefly is what is a theologian? Uh, and the reason why I wanna ask that is because first, critique of radical theology is often, well, it's not theology. Uh, it is the end of theology or it's simple atheism. Uh, it is not a theological project. It doesn't look like orthodox, confessional, Christian theology. Um, and that critique uh, is not made actually by, you know, some first rate theologians, but it was made at the time. Uh, so what is a theologian? Well, we could do a whole five week course on that. But in brief, you could say that a theologian is someone who reflects on the meaning of the incarnation, crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, right? They look at what that means or doesn't mean. Uh, and I, I pick incarnation, crucifixion and resurrection because they are really the, what is unique to Christianity. Now in Hinduism, there is a form of incarnation with Vishnu and stuff like that, but uh, it's suitably different. We're talking about theology is the rational exploration of, of Christianity um, from within the community. Uh, and those elements are very, very central to the Christian uh, tradition. So anyone who's a theologian will be thinking about those notions and what they mean. Uh, and the more abstract the theologian, or the more philosophical the theologian, uh, the more these ideas become kind of metaphysical notions, metaphysical reflections on reality. Uh, so funnily enough, when you, you read some theologians when they talk about Christ, it can be very confusing because you think that they're talking about a guy who lived a couple of thousand years ago called Jesus, who was given this title the messiah the christ uh, who lived who spoke who acted who died and who you know many confessional uh, christians say rose from the dead right but a lot of theologians that's not what they're meaning when they use the term christ uh, christ is a shorthand for a moment in history when the idea of the absolute the truth uh, the primordial being, and I'll explain what that means in a second, but God, right, enters into the world, empties God's self into the world, and then dies. And then through that death, resurrects, uh, creating a new epoch, a new form of being, right? So suddenly you've stripped it all back, right? You're not talking about whether someone existed or whether they didn't, what Jesus said or didn't say, right? Which is kind of liberal thought. You're talking about um, uh, the Christ is a name for the description of this, what's called kenosis, this emptying, this self-emptying of the absolute into the human, into death, into resurrection. And Hegel is, is the, you know, the, the greatest philosopher stroke theologian in terms of this exploration. Hegel is attempting in his book, The Phenomenology of Spirit, to chart the development of mind, to chart the growth of consciousness and self-consciousness in the world. Now, Hegel isn't interested in the, how the, the brain functions and how the brain creates consciousness. Uh, what Hegel's interested in is what kind of universe has self-consciousness as a potentiality, right? Like, um, because for self-consciousness to exist, it has to have been a potential. It has to have been able to potentially exist for it to exist. And what is it in the universe that has brought us to this point where self-consciousness arises? And one way to think about this is the difference between if you're writing a book uh, or you feel that a book is being written through you, right? So if you're writing a book or you're writing a song, that's one thing, you're in control of it, you're putting it down on paper. Uh, if you feel that the song is 
kind of using you in order to be written. It's like that song had to exist. Now, it doesn't really exist in some pre-place, right? But it feels like it. It feels like this, this song has potentiality and it actually required you uh, in order to get written. You are the delivery mechanism of this song. And if you talk to artists, this is often how they talk. They say, like, I don't paint, something paints through me. Uh, I don't write, something writes through me. It's like I had to learn all of these skills because this story so needed to be told that it required that I existed for it to be written. And you can almost feel that in Hegel. Hegel is saying that there is this drive to self-consciousness within being itself. And uh, that drive to self-consciousness erupts in physicality and brain function and all of that cool stuff. But he wants to explore this notion of mind becoming aware of itself. And uh, for him, theology, Christianity, offers a type of uh, mythical way of describing what is a cosmic or metaphysical truth, right? I know, I hope you're still with me. I know this is all uh, abstract, but I, my job is to try to make it concrete. So, uh, in relation to this, radical theologians are definitely theologians because radical theologians are interested in the incarnation, the crucifixion and resurrection. In fact, you could say that there is nobody, uh, no group of individuals who have more forcefully tried to explore the absolute consequences of this notion than the radical theologians. They are so caught up in these, these ideas. Um, so in that sense, they are, they are theologians. Apart from anything else, they are very influenced by the early Karl Barth, not the later Karl Barth, but the early Karl Barth um, and, and other theological thinkers. So what is a theologian? Theologian is someone who rationally reflects on the meaning of the in, uh, incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Are radical theologians theologians? Well, yes, because that's what they reflect on, particularly someone like Altizer. His whole work is exploring these notions in a way that would make orthodox theologians blush. Right? Um, okay, so... Now let's go on to, so what is, what is a radical theologian? And this brings us to the preface of the book, Radical Theology and the Death of God. Um, in the, the original preface, there are two prefaces in the book. Uh, so the original preface, uh, William uh, Hamilton, he outlines kind of like 10 ways in which this term death of God can be used. Now the term death of God goes right back to the death of Christ on the cross, right? People hear the term death of God and they think it's something negative, bad, right? Uh, Anti-Christian, but it's right there uh, at the heart of Christianity. And then it's seen in theology and it's seen in Luther. Uh, Hegel talks about it probably in the most extreme way. Hegel's probably the main theologian or philosopher of the death of God, of radical theology. So there's Hegel and Nietzsche, and then there's generation one which are people like uh, Gabriel uh, Van Hanian, Paul Van Buren, uh, William Hamilton, uh, Thomas Altizer, maybe early Mary Daly, Simone Weil to some extent. These are kind of the first generation. Um, and so the death of God is in Hegel, then it's in Nietzsche, and Nietzsche is the one who really popularizes it. So we all know the death of God from Nietzsche's parable of a madman who goes into a marketplace crying out, I seek God. I seek God. Uh, and the story goes that there's lots of people who mock him. And then the man smashes a lantern and transfixes them with his glances and says, where is God? I will tell you, God is dead and you have killed him. And then he goes on to the churches and he says, these are the tombs of God. Uh, so death of God are radical theologians. Those terms are interchangeable uh, broadly. Um, they, uh, they take seriously this notion, this event, call the death of God. But then Hamilton, he outlines 10 different ways in which this event can be thought of, right? And the, I won't go through them all, but the first one is basically, well, the death of God just means God doesn't exist. The death of God is a term for the non-existence of some absolute being, right? And he says that's kind of the most uh, kind of atheistic version of the death of God. Number nine, the second one, is uh, God did exist, 
and has died. So it's a more literalistic reading. When someone says God has died, they're actually talking about something has died in the world. And Hamilton says that's kind of where a lot of radical theology is, uh, the radical theology of Altizer. And then he keeps going. Then it comes down to the death of God means that our notions of God have died and need to be radically rethought, reconfigured. Uh, then it goes on to our theologies just need to be redeveloped. We need a new liturgy right down to um, uh, all notions of God are inadequate. So we just have to remind ourselves that, that as soon as we name God, that God has to die. Right? So you name God, you have to unname God. So you've got all of these, and that's the most theistic. So at one extreme, the death of God means God doesn't exist, never did. The other extreme, it's just a reminder that all of our images of God are just dead images. They're useful, they can be good, but don't ever think that they capture the living God. Now Hamilton is saying that anyone who falls within that very broad field could be described in one way or another as a, as a radical theologian. Um, there's a family resemblance between all of them. Uh, not much of a family resemblance, but a little bit. But at one extreme, which is where we're just, you know, you have to remind yourself that your images of God are not God, that's, that, that person's just vaguely um, maybe influenced by radical theology. They have like a, they've maybe dipped their toe in. And at the other side, that's where radical theology proper starts. Um, atheism isn't, for, for Hamilton, that's not radical theology. Uh, one, of the re one of the things I disagree with, by the way, here, um, uh, I'm going to disagree a number of times with what's written. Uh, one is that Hamilton says that atheism is the most extreme, and then there is the death of God, but I would reverse those, and uh, we might get into why. Uh, later on in the course. Otherwise, I've got other seminars on that. There's one called Why Atheism Isn't Enough, and you can go and have a look at that. Um, but, uh, you know, you've got this full remit of Altizer at one extreme and then at the other, someone who's like, okay, yeah, the death of God means that we remind ourselves that we can never describe the, the absolute truth that we feel grounded in. But, um, Hamilton also elsewhere gives us a, a different way of thinking about what is a radical theologian. And I think this is even more helpful. Um, that despite the differences, there are three elements that, that would define you as a radical theologian. And he beautifully puts it as the detective, the assassin, and the artist. So the detective. Death of God theologians find a carcass of God. Right? They find a dead God in the world and they want to work out why this corpse is there, who killed, who killed God, why did they kill God, when did they kill God, how did they kill God. So a radical theologian is a detective. They take seriously history, that in history, not everybody, in fact not the majority of people, but in various epochs, notions of God die. And they want to understand that process. They want to work it out. And so a lot of the radical theologians have done really interesting work in what's called secularization theory. Um, the theory that uh, we are getting progressively more secular. That's a controversial idea. And the sociologist Peter Berger um, you know, is, is a very big critic of secularization theory. But um, we'll put that to one side for a second and say that, that broadly speaking, you might want to say, oh yeah, God died in terms of objectively with the enlightenment and subjectively in terms of um, existentialism, the experience of world wars, etc. Uh, there's something going on that even religious people today are very different from religion, religious people in the past. Uh, something that Charles Taylor explores in his book, A Secular Age. Um, so the detective, right? Are you interested in this carcass of God? Like why, why do gods die? How do they die? How, has a certain view of God died in the 20th century? And what is that? And Bonhoeffer called that God the deus ex machina. Uh, uh, Heidegger called it the ontotheological God, which is the God that, that is a hypothesis for life. Um, basically Descartes' God, because Descartes had an argument that um, 
he basically had an argument that God necessarily exists uh, because we have an idea of God in our minds and we couldn't have put that there because we could not imagine something like God. You can't imagine something that is so much greater than you. Uh, it's beyond our capacity. So Descartes, and I'm simplifying a lot, sorry, but Descartes has this view that God put the idea of God in our minds. And then Descartes says that it's because of the existence of God that we can trust our senses. Uh, we can trust what we see and what we hear. Not completely, as in you need to use logic and reason, but if we think, um, if we use logic, if we are reasonable people, we can trust the conclusions we come to. So Heidegger calls this the ontotheological God. It's God as not like a reality that you participate in, but more like a hypothesis that you require in order to do science. Uh, so that God seems to die, and the death of God theologians are detectives exploring that. But then secondly, and go a bit further, is death of God theologians are assassins. So to stretch the metaphor a little, uh, what happens is the death of God theologians realize that this body isn't quite dead, that this body is reanimated at times. So there are reversals, there are revivals of superstitious notions of God. Uh, there are reversals, there are revivals, um, there are resuscitations of this God. And the radical theologian is the one who says, ah, it's our job to kill it. Not just to work out why it's dead, but actually in, 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 in working out why it's dead, we've discovered that no, this body isn't quite dead. There's a Frankenstein element to it. And that, that theology and theologians should dedicate themselves to the death of that God and to helping people through liturgy experience that death of God. And then finally, the artist. Uh, the, the, the radical theologian is a theopoet. Uh, they want to create something beautiful out of this loss. That actually the true flourishing of, of the ideas within theology will occur in the aftermath of this death. Right? Once this God has died, something new will erupt. And the radical theologian wants to be part of the artistic expression of this resurrection of what comes after the death of God and this is why the course is called the dialectics of God because what you see is you see there's an affirmation God exists there is a negation God doesn't exist and that's a radical no and then there is what's called the negation of negation where that negation is itself negated that no is itself rejected um, and in that, in that rejection, something new arises and erupts. Okay, so what we've covered so far in this introduction is what is, what is a theologian? And very briefly, I said, well, at the very least, a theologian studies the incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection. Radical theologians, they study that, they look at that. Uh, radical theology is a body of work and thinkers who are interested in what this notion death of God means. What is the event of the death of God? Does it mean that God didn't exist, never existed? Does it mean simply that we should be humble about our language? And then finally, using Hamilton's language of saying radical theologian can be identified primarily as being a detective, an assassin, and an artist. Now then, what I want to do is start talking about Altizer a little bit. And I want to talk about his notion of God dying, right? When you read Altizer, it's like he seems to be saying that God existed and God has literally died and that we should be encouraging that death, that death is ongoing, and that in the aftermath of that death, theology will be reborn. Uh, there'll be a new form of future church, a new form of liturgy, and a new form of life, a new form of community, one that will break free um, will open up a different type of politics, a different type of personal existence, uh, a different form of community, right? So it's, it's a huge claim. It's like it's, it's an epochal change, right? Um, so what does that mean? Because it's counterintuitive at first. The, like the idea of God dying 
is is kind of at first so counterintuitive and ridiculous that it's hard to make sense of it. It's hard to take it seriously. Okay, so my job is to try to kind of make sense of Altizer. Uh, in light of this, by the way, uh, John Cobb said that you've got to understand that Altizer isn't an ontological realist. And that means Altizer isn't talking about reality. Altizer is, believes that history is vitally important. So whenever you know, to, uh, Altizer is talking about the death of God. He's not talking about some objective reality out there. He's talking about how we experience the death of God in our history, in our subjectivity, in our culture. Um, and this is very close to maybe what an atheist would mean by the death of God, where they say, well, God didn't die. There's no death of God. God never was alive. But there is an experience of the death of God in our culture. However, I think Cobb is wrong here. And in fact, interestingly, um, in a republication of that essay that he wrote in the 70s, that section is removed. And I'm guessing it's because the work of Altizer really post that article shows that he actually is an ontological realist. <laughs> uh, you can't square the circle that easily. Um, Altizer really seems to be claiming that something dies that we can call God. Okay, so. What does that mean? If, if he is an ontological realist, what are we talking about? Well, let's start with a cosmological claim, right? The Big Bang, right? So let's think about the Big Bang um, as uh, there is a moment where there is an infinitely dense point. Basically, a type of nothing is something that is so infinitely dense, a singularity. And that singularity erupts. And in the eruption of that infinitely dense point, pinpoint, uh, the universe with space and time is created. So in that moment of eruption of the infinite density of the, the singularity, it erupts, space and time and universe is created as this expands. So there's this ongoing expansion. This is a type of kenosis. Uh, which is what the incarnation is, right? God emptying God's self into Christ. Uh, there's a, the, the word kenosis comes from a passage in Philippians where you know, it says God becomes a man, God becomes nothing, God empties God's self. And in a way, cosmologically, that can be seen as, as uh, what, what actually happens, that this infinite dense, infinitely dense, like say, <laughs> nothingness, uh, erupts and as it empties itself which means its, it's density uh, diminishes it empties itself and in the emptying the universe is created and if you think cosmologically for a second you go okay there's these moments in cosmic history there is being out of nothingness and there is life out of being and there is consciousness out of life, and there is self-consciousness out of consciousness. Right? In the universe, there is this potentiality for all of these moments that happen. Right? And how, how, how many times, or how many universes are there where this didn't happen, or lack of universes? But in our universe, uh, being comes out of this singularity, this, this infinitely dense nothingness. Um, out of being, just rocks and atoms and molecules comes life out of life eventually comes consciousness and out of consciousness eventually comes self-consciousness pretty incredible um, you can read this cosmic history as the ongoing emptying of the primordial one uh, and that's, uh, Altizer calls this the, uh, what do you call it? The primordial transcendence, right? Which is in classical theology, God. God is everything. God is the all in all, right? Um, and then Altizer is just simply saying, yeah, well, in cosmic history, you, you postulate this one that then erupts and empties itself. Uh, and its first emptying is into being. The second emptying is into life. And why is life? A different density of emptying itself well you could say that it's because life distinguishes itself 
from everything else. Like before there is life, there is no, there's just stuff. But life at a very primordial level experiences itself in an environment. So there is this separation. So there's a lack. There's another emptying. There's another nothingness comes into the world. And then consciousness is like, think of like your dog. Your dog is very aware of being in an environment and interacts with, with its environment. So there's this second level of feeling of separation, of, of lack. And then self-consciousness, and we can't get into the ins and outs of it, but again, I have other seminars where I look at this, but self-consciousness is itself another type of lack. When I'm self-consciousness, self-conscious, I know that I am not one with everything around me and also not one with myself. There is antagonism and self-consciousness is this form of kind of this radical antagonism within ourselves. So don't worry too much about, about those different elements. Just think of the cosmic history as this point that then erupts as it empties itself into the world. And so then all Altizer is saying, it suddenly becomes almost mundane, is like, oh, the death of God is saying that the primordial one empties itself into the world and this cosmic truth is seen in evidence in the story of Christ or the story of Christmas of God becoming human um, so it looks back it is within history an event that looks back and uh, theologically explains something uh, within physics Another little aside, by the way, is I think Altizer is kind of wrong here. And um, uh, this is where Shizek brings something very, very important to the mix. Uh, Shizek would say that what starts is the nothingness, <laughs> is the emptying. And then we imagine a fullness that exists. So he wrote a book called Less Than Nothing, where Shizek makes an argument for um, not a singular, primordial, infinitely dense point but rather um, a type of uh, kenosis, kenotic event that happens that then uh, we postulate has some sort of infinitely dense moment. I'm not gonna go into details about that. I'm sorry, I keep on, I just wanna make a few kind of like um, uh, point in directions of difference and, and whatnot, but that's not the important thing at the moment. I just kind of wanna make sense of what Altizer is saying. So he says that there is, in Christ, in that image of the incarnation and the crucifixion, is a, is a theological story of the cosmos. And then secondly, which we've looked at, he says, and this event then rumbles afterwards. There's a reversal. People don't take seriously the event. They don't understand it. But it rumbles. And by the time you get to the scholastic period, the medieval period of thought, this notion of the death of God starts to percolate, starts to get feet, starts to get traction. And it culminates with the Enlightenment. It culminates with these very devout religious people saying that God is not a hypothesis. So Newton is a very religious man. He said, in the, in the absence of all other evidence, the thumb alone would convince me of the existence of God. So he's, he has a very deep subjective belief in God and he believes that the physical universe cries out that God exists but in his scientific work he is a methodological atheist in other words he acts like there are purely natural causes for what's going on um, so then so Altizer is saying the Christ event points back to cosmic history and what's all, what's ongoing what's unfolding in cosmic history it points forward to the objective death of God that culminates in the, you know, the enlightenment. And it points towards the death of God subjectively, which we see in the 19th and 20th centuries, right? Um, so that's why all ties are so interested in this event of God. It's like, oh, it's a kenosis, a divine kenosis that speaks of something. And for all ties are, you can't get to resurrection until you have gone all the way in this death of God, the unfolding death of God. But you'll notice that there's, there's multiple unfoldings. There's the unfolding in terms of being from nothingness, life from being, 
consciousness from life, self-consciousness from, from consciousness, uh, in objective reality in history and subjective reality. Um, but there's also reversals in all of this. Uh, there's a reverse, like there are some people and some movements where God is a hypothesis within science. Creationists, for example, uh, attempt to use God as an hypothesis within the scientific uh, arena. And uh, whenever people say creationists aren't scientific, in, in technical sense they are. They, they very much believe in the scientific endeavor. Um, but God is not dead. Objectively, God is um, a, a hypothesis required in order to make sense of scientific data. And of course, subjectively, there are lots of communities in Los Angeles, there are lots of communities that ha people have subjective experiences of being part of wholeness and oneness, etc. Um, but we're just talking about, as I say, the kind of high points in a culture, the high points of the science, the high points of the art, the high points of the music and the literature. Um, now the question that immediately arises once you see what's happening in terms of Altizer's experience of the death of God is like, well, why have we not got to a different form of church, a different form of life, a different form of being? Um, why is it that in the 70s and the 80s there was a return to fundamentalism and evangelicalism? Uh, how, how does that explain? Um, and this is where, just to, to talk briefly, to jump forward in time, this is where the work of Slavio Shizek is important because Shizek uses Lacan, uh, Saguan's Lacan, to argue that God is not dead uh, in our unconscious. Lacan famously said that, that God is unconscious, which means that God remains alive. This notion of God remains not within our subjectivity, not within objectivity, but within our unconscious. And that means, I mean, that sounds very abstract, but it kind of means that we act theologically in a, in a, in a, uh, fundamentalist way. <laughs> we believe that there is some wholeness, primordial oneness that we can get back to. And that plays out in, in our obsession with self-help, of trying to be some ideal type of person, plays out in our Instagrams, play, play, plays out in our frenetic pursuit of more money or jobs or all of this. It, this denial of this canonic emptying uh, this desire for fullness and oneness, even if we don't believe it subjectively, even if we don't believe in it in terms of our work. So for example, you might be, and this is, this is a good example actually, is a, somebody I met briefly who worked in the oil industry. And so they knew, they worked with oil, they knew that the, the existence of oil was evidence of billions and billions of creatures dying <laughs> uh, over uh, countless eons. But they also fully subjectively believed in a, a young earth creation, right? So they kind of uh, weirdly um, had this in their, their objective work uh, in terms of uh, as a chemist working with, uh, within the petro petroleum industry, they acted as if God was dead, but in their private subjective experience, they uh, believed that the earth was 6,000 years old and that oil had just been put there by God or whatever. Um, and so it's a version of that. It's like we may not consciously, so it's a, it's a next level down from that. It's like we may consciously not think that there is some way of, us, of being whole and complete, but we still pursue frantically what in psychoanalysis is called the lost object, frantically pursue something that will fill us. And you see this played out every day in most Hollywood movies and most songs. And in our daily life, we see this frenetic pursuit uh, going on. Um, and so for someone like Shizek, we need to experience the death of God in our unconscious as well. And that's very key to parotheology, right? That, that parotheology is a theory and a technology for enacting the death of God unconsciously so that we can get to the resurrection, which is a different conception, a different way of being, um, a way of... Uh, being within God, you could say, if you want to put like a more mystical language to it. Um, uh, it's an attempt to enact that. Now, for that to happen globally or happen within a society, it, it would have to be seen in the art, the music, the TV shows, the movies of the time. That the, the, it would have to have life 
in the very um, mind of the culture. And I don't think we're there yet. But you can have it among individuals and communities. And so that power of theology is an attempt to enact that in various communities around the world um, in the hope that it is leaning into the assassination of that type of God <laughs> um, so that we can become the artist, right? Um, okay, let's see where we are. Um, okay, there's a couple of things. I, I kind of feel like I'm talking away here and I'm hoping that it kind of makes sense. Like if, if at any stage what I'm saying begins to lose touch with reality, <laughs> um, just keep coming back to the detective, the assassin and the artist and the dialectics. There is a, go there is a God who empties God's self into a type of nothingness and that emptying when it's fully done doesn't give birth to nihilism, it gives birth to something incredibly beautiful. Like, the, so the creation of the universe is this self-emptying that creates something beautiful. So as God, like when God died objectively, it didn't lead to the end of science, but actually to a phenomenal development within the sciences. Chemistry, for example, you know, moved beyond being alchemy. Uh, biology uh, uh, became, you know, influenced by evolution, the evolutionary theory. Uh, is, is the name for the death of God really in, in biology and chemistry is the death of God in alchemy and in physics, these different, in, in economics, these different uh, areas of life. Uh, it was incredibly fertile, this death of God. And the same in terms of the subjective death of God um, was very, very fertile in terms of its critique of um, totalitarianism in its uh, in its um, the the protests against um, fascism uh, I'm thinking of like dadaism and surrealism and and existentialism which was an incredible there are some great writers who were existentialists who wrote beautifully against what Marcuse talks about the one-dimensional man which is basically where we are uh, uh, our subjectivity, our humanity is drained from us in this kind of industrial world that we live in. And existentialism, you know, rallies the subjective experience of meaninglessness to something valuable and good. And so within, say, pyrotheology, which is attempting to enact this death of God in the unconscious, uh, the idea is, the risk is that this will actually become something beautiful. It could be a disaster. Like when people do atheism for Lent, which is a practice of, of power theology, uh, I don't want to ever say, well, if you do atheism for Lent, you will come out the other side better and healthier and um, freer. But the, the, the secret is that's what I see time and time again as I run atheism for Lent, people come out the other side, some people, you know, it doesn't do anything for them or whatever. Some people don't last, but some people, it is a life-giving experience. And so the, the, I can't promise that it will be, but that's the dialectic faith. The faith in dialectic is that, is that as this death is enacted, you won't enter into the dark. You think you're going to enter into the darkness. Oh my goodness, if I, if I experience this emptying, this loss, then it's going to be terrible, right? And that's how everyone feels. I'm going to unravel. And that's why I talk about raveling. Like to unravel is to pull apart, but to ravel is also to pull apart, but it's actually, it doesn't have the negative on, it sounds very positive. You're not unraveling, you're raveling. But you can only turn the unraveling to raveling when you're doing it, right? You can only once, you can only find your life once you've lost it. That's the dialectic, you lose your life to find it. And if you're only losing your life because you know you're gonna find it, you're not losing your life. You enter into the dark night of the soul. You enter into the death of God, not knowing what's gonna happen. But the faith of dialectics is, and the faith of radical theology is, oh, resurrection will happen. And that we'll look at resurrection later on in this course and what that might mean. Um, I don't wanna go there too quickly. Uh, I'll say one more thing, and then I'll look to see if there are any questions. Okay, one more thing about Altizer that makes him an interesting theologian is that this self-emptying of God uh, gives us a different notion and a different appreciation of what evil is, right? So traditionally, 
God is everything. God is what is. Um, and evil, the, the, the problem of evil, well, what is evil? If God is everything uh, and evil exists, then God has evil in God's self. The Godhead has evil within itself. And uh, one of the ways around this in scholastic philosophy, and I think it was, um, uh, I think it was, oh, ooh, I'm going to say Augustine, who was kind of the prime thinker in this, but uh, uh, Aquinas as well. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'm, I'm a wee bit rusty now, but um, but it was it was the predominant idea in the scholastic period is the idea that evil doesn't exist. God is everything, and so evil is nothing. Uh, evil is nothingness itself. God is all in all, the infinitely dense <laughs> primordial singularity, right? The primordial transcendence. Evil then is a negation. So evil is not part of God. So evil is like the hole in your shoe. The hole doesn't exist, but the hole lets in water. So you're walking in a rainy day. It's raining in LA, which is pretty beautiful to see. <laughs> um, uh, you're walking in the rain. There's a hole in your shoe. The hole creates a gap for the water to hit your foot, but the hole doesn't exist. It's a lack of existence. And that was one of the ways that people tried to start to come to terms with why there is so much evil that we can see. Um, uh, not just not like you know, animals eating animals. We're talking about human evil. We're talking about the, the torture and destruction of others. We're talking about world wars. We're talking about resentments, all of that stuff. Um, but Altizer gives a different view because Altizer in saying that God or the infinite one uh, canonically empties God's self into the world, then God is both everything and nothing. God is the creation of nothing. It's just like in physics, the Big Bang is the creation of the universe itself with its gaps, with its voids, right? Um, God is both everything and the, the lack of everything. And so you go, well, what is evil? And go, in this reading, um, and actually the book, you, if you want to go into this, is I think it's called The Godhead and the Nothing, something like that that Altizer wrote. I think it's Godhead and the Nothing. Um, uh, but it could be slightly different. But the notion here is that, oh, it's not lack that is evil. It is our inability to make peace with the lack that's evil. Right? It's not that, that we try to avoid uh, the doubts that we have, the questions that we have, the sense of meaninglessness that we have, the sense of death that we uh, see in life and that we're hurtling towards. It's not that that, that is the evil. Nothingness is the evil. It is our frantic attempt to avoid confronting the nothingness and the lack, the canonic self-emptying of the universe that results in wars, in pursuing things to the detriment of ourselves and of our family, um, our resentments over other people because we imagine they have the thing that makes them whole and complete. You know, this explains jealousy, it explains envy, it explains resentment, it explains so much of the violence uh, that we see in the world. Uh, not like the you break a leg because you trip kind of suffering. But we're talking about the type of the type of what's called sin, which is a type of human evil that um, that uh, results from the the avoidance of our own finitude, the avoidance of our own lack, and of tarrying with our lack. So although Altizer wouldn't put it in those words necessarily, that's one of the consequences and one of the reasons why I think radical theology has something beautiful to say. It's saying that that evil is not the lack, which is what society says, right? That's what we, we kind of intuitively believe, that this lack is the problem. If only we, that's why science today, we're going like, we can abolish death. We can, uh, you know, take a pill to get rid of anxiety, which is, you know, fear of nothingness. We can uh, do certain practices that will, um, help us avoid uh, the sense of meaninglessness or, or whatever, right? We're trying to avoid a confrontation with the negative. Radical theology says, no, we need to go right in there. And that actually entering into the radical negative is entering into the truth of Christianity. When Christ cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, we see a theological expression of this idea that God experiences the lack the nothingness, God feels that. 
So when we feel it, we are standing in the sight of God. Uh, most uh, religions, all religions really have an explanation of why we experience lack, right? It can be uh, uh, in the West, I'll talk about the West primarily, uh, the lack is a temptation we have to resist or it is a necessary part of life that we can't get rid of, maybe in the next life we do, or it's an evil that we have to fight against, right? There's these various ways, but here in the radical theology, you have the notion that no, when you experience a lack and a separation from the one, you are standing with and within the one, because the one is not one. <laughs> the one involves and includes the lack. So we are in our experience of doubt, actually expressing something of the truth of reality itself. <clears throat> okay, quick summary, see if there's any questions. Hopefully some of you have made it this far. Uh, a theologian um, reflects on the incarnation, death, resurrection of Christ. Uh, Christ for many theologians is the name given to this movement of self-emptying of the world that has cosmic implications, objective implications, subjective implications, and unconscious implications. Radical theologians enter into that. They explore that, they push it as far as they can, believing in this dialectic uh, negation, this self-emptying that, that will create new forms of community uh, in politics and in personal life. Uh, Altizer is probably the greatest of, the, of generation one. Uh, generation two, you've got people like uh, Mark Taylor and Slavoj Žižek that are probably most f faithful to that first generation. Um, and yeah, this, this notion then means that evil is not the lack, that uh, the lack is something that we need to make space for in our lives. That is the challenge and that we need liturgical technologies in order to enter into that. And that's why in the first chapter, which I hardly touched on, because there's not much in it, and hopefully you've read it, but uh, it, one, of the, one of the few interesting things in it is that it says, um, oh, what did it say? Oh, I forget what it said. I lose my, I lose my track sometimes, so I don't know what, what I was saying. What was I saying? That, oh, as we, as we embrace this lack and embrace this negation, something put oh yeah yeah i remember yeah hamilton says that radical theology has not much to say to the confessional church if you're asking what has radical theology got to say to the actual existing church the answer is not very much because the actual existing church is primarily interested in helping us avoid the lack and get back to the one but hamilton says if you're talking about future church if you're talking about a type of liturgy that enacts this move this dialect movement, then it's got a lot to say. It's going to create some very new forms of practices. Um, and it's precisely that that I'm trying to do with power of theology. Okay, so that is the movement in general. I'm just going to see if anyone has any questions and then uh, I will let you go. Okay, we have a few. Uh, uh, Jemima says, What's the difference between a subjective experience of the death of God, existential meaninglessness, and the experience of the death of God in the unconscious? Brilliant, thank you for that. This is such a brilliant question that um, it actually requires uh, a lot to unpack. I, I will say a little bit about it now, but I've also done some seminars on this, and I'm trying to think of the name of some of them. Um, there's some power seminars where I've talked about this expressly, but the difference is this, the, the death of God existentially um, is felt. I mean, it's not completely true, but go with me for now, right? It's when you look at the great art and literature of the kind of early mid 20th century, there is this sense of meaninglessness. And there is this uh, expression of the, of the everyday person experiencing a type of anxiety, the growth of anxiety, the growth of a sense of uh, what is my life purpose about? And uh, it, it reflects in people not getting you know, uh, value out of their work, out of their family life, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say, and actually Jer Jemima, um, as I'm talking, I think uh, your question, I, I'm getting it a little bit deeper now, is that actually, 
when you talk about existentially experiencing the death of God, it doesn't have to be consciously. Um, so maybe I would say this, what the original death of God theologians were doing is they were expressing that in our subjective experience, our experience of life, there was an increase in anxiety. There is an increase in meaninglessness as such. But there wasn't enough, uh, 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 there, there wasn't enough work in terms of the psychoanalytic stuff, the unconscious. So what ultimately happens is that is read as we as human beings experience a sense of the loss of God in our consciousness, in our everyday life. And what Lacan brings in is a distinction. So he brings a distinction into this. And the distinction is, yeah, okay, but you can't feel that consciously and you can start to admit that and you can go, there is no uh, you know, proof of God in my subjective experience. Uh, this is what Kierkegaard was trying to do. He was trying to, in a sense, root God in the subjective experience. And he said that the, that the common person um, doesn't, can't do that in the same way. They may still believe in God, but they don't feel the presence of God. They feel a type of absence of God. They, their experience of God is the experience of the loss of God. And Hamilton talks about that. He says, radical theology isn't the absence of experience of God, it's the experience of the absence of God. So that's the experience. But then I suppose Lacan is saying what happens is you can then get on with life you can kind of make peace with that consciously, but yet unconsciously it remains. And it comes up in your way of interacting with your work, with money, with property, with things. And what happens is you have a weird type of experience where you can existentially go, like the ironic gesture, go like, yeah, no, I know that we have to deal with doubt and unknowing and we don't have the answers, but, we have this unconscious sense in which we do have the answers, we do know, we do, and it, it plays out. So when someone experiences the death of their family, their father, say, they know their father is dead, but yet they still act as if their father is alive. They still maybe try to go out with people who they think their father would uh, uh, like or dislike if they didn't like their father. So all of that waffling to say, I want to kind of make a distinction between what they were saying, like subjectively you experience this sense of God is gone in some sort of conscious way. And then Lacan is saying that even when you've come to terms with that, at an unconscious level, you, you act as if uh, you believe that there is some practice, some self-help book, something that will fix everything. Um, and the reason why I'm, I'm hesitating a little bit in my answer is because I think what you're saying, if I hear you right, is like, but that kind of is implied in subjectivity. The, the death of God existentially would be the death of God unconsciously. If that's what, if that's what you're asking, I'm going like, yeah, that's, that's a good point. And that we, we just want to make a distinction that the death of God has to go deeper. That's always what Altizer is saying, is like, we have to go deeper. The apocalypse has to go for, so, because Tillich, or sorry, Altizer talks about apocalyptic thinking. And apocalypse is the, what happens that we cannot imagine. Once we have negated the world, something else will arise that we cannot even think about, right? We don't even know what it's gonna look like. And uh, the death, until the death of God goes right down into our unconscious, that apocalypse won't happen. And that's what I think Shizek means when Shizek famously said a few times, he goes, it's easier for us to imagine populating Mars. It's easier for us to imagine uh, abolishing death with technology than it is to imagine giving health care to everybody, right? That is a, a very cl a funny way of saying, it's easier for us to imagine um, technological changes and innovations within our world than to imagine a fundamentally different type of world, a world where we are not frenetically pursuing wholeness and completeness. So we can think of all manner of technological ways in which we can get wholeness and completeness, but we can't imagine as a society what it might look like to have a, have a whole society that, doesn't, that isn't frenetically caught up in this pursuit. 
that's a kind of way of trying to unpack, I think, what she's ex saying in that little pithy comment. I hope that was useful. Lana says, oh, uh, oh, there's a few, oh, there's well, lots of questions, hold on. Jemima says, all ties would also say William Blake is one origin of the Death of God movement. Yes, alongside Hegel. As the first to enact the death of God in his art and poetry. Uh, if you fancy some fun. Oh yeah, you're just pointing that out. Yeah, I uh, and that's not my expertise at all. I really haven't read very much of Blake at all. But Altizer really sees Blake as the, yeah, you say the artistic form of the death of God and Hegel as the philosophical form. Uh, uh, Lana says, I wonder if Altizer was familiar with newer New Testament scholarship. Reading Paul with the Greek rhetorical device uh, called, oh, uh, prosopiae. I can't pronounce that. Proso, prosopiae or whatever. <laughs> uh, suggests Paul experienced the subjective death of God. Oh, well, that's interesting, Lana. Um, Altizer would definitely be up on all of that, like he was very, very up on stuff like that. Um, but I'm just interested in what you're saying. That, um, I'd love to hear more about that, that Paul. But you're right, yeah, Paul's subjective experience of the death of God. Now, when I talk about the unconscious, by the way, that's not Altizer, that's Shizek. I mean, Altizer, he is really talking about um, when this subjective experience starts to erupt in Western history. And for him, it's like the 19th, 20th century. But yet, yeah, Altizer feels that it hasn't fully happened. But Altizer would agree with you in the sense of he would see, uh, he sees that story of Paul and of, and of Christ crucified as having an embryonic form, all of this. Um, like, that's why it, it's weird, because it almost sounds like when you read Altizer, he's saying that it all happened 2000 years ago, right? The death of God happened. And then you go, well, well how is it happening in the 20th century if it happened in the first century? And Altizer kind of saying, well, it happened in embryonic form, it was all expressed in the New Testament. And that expression points back to cosmology and forward to the objective and subjective. So I think when you're saying that, Lana, Altizer would be like, absolutely, 100%. It's all in there. Um, oh, Rob saying, I'm reading Altizer's new gospel of Christian atheism, and he briefly touches on it. Oh, yeah, this, uh, he briefly touches on, I think, what Lana's just been saying. I think that's what you mean. Uh, he doesn't describe it in that way, but he does suggest that Paul did experience the death of God. Nice one, Rob. Yeah, that's, uh, he wrote, as you know, in the 1966, the, the Gospel of Christian Atheism. And then I think it's what, the year 2000, 2005, he writes the new Gospel of Christian Atheism, which is an updated version. And uh, that if you want to get an Altizer, that's a good place to go. Rob, you're doing more homework than you're required to. Well done. <laughs> star for you you get the hymn book uh yeah you, you say at least i'm hope i'm reading him correctly yes yeah, rob saying like altizer is a difficult person to read and um hamilton says it beautifully like hamilton in this book radical theology and the death of god says that altizer writes in a way that would make an analytic philosopher weep uh, that would make anybody who's interested in empiricism and clarity like uh, lose their hair and it is true i actually don't like how Altizer uh, writes. I find it repetitive, it's too bombastic, and um, uh, there's times where it's beautiful and it's very prophetic, but uh, I find his writing difficult, um, difficult in the sense of I think it's a weakness on his part. Uh, he was very troubled as a, as a person. He suffered from psychosis, and uh, he has this type of bombastic, prophetic, type of language that, that, that you really have to work hard to get through. It's possible to do, but this is where Hamilton is a much clearer writer. Um, Lana says, I'm finding that recent talk about spirit stroke source, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, um, attempts to bring about unconscious thought of the old God I experienced to be dead. Maybe I'm taking it too seriously. Let me just read that again. Uh, I'm finding the recent, the recent talk about the spirit or source attempts to bring about unconscious thoughts of the old God I experienced to be dead. Maybe I'm taking it too seriously. I'm interested in what you're saying, Anna. I'd, I'd need to hear more, but um, uh, I don't have enough to kind of like comment on what you're saying, but that's more of a comment anyway. Um, let's see. 
Okay, it's most of it's just conversation um, that I'm eavesdropping in. Okay, that's, I hope that has offered a little bit of clarity as to what is going on with these thinkers, particularly Altizer. Uh, we're going to now, in the next few weeks, look at different chapters in this book. And each seminar title is the chapter that you can read. So if you want to know what chapter you should be reading, uh, just look at the title for the next week. I can't remember what it is, otherwise I would tell you what it is. But uh, in, in the midst of all of this very difficult prose of Altizer and his bombastic, like he uses the word apocalypse every five words in one book I read, like he, this very uh, uh, prophetic kind of language, is really just this story of this canonic self-emptying that he feels we need to be within, a process that we need to lean into, to give ourselves to, um, and as we do that, uh, this will have, a, you know, I, 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 it, this will bring about different modes of being, different realities. The resurrection that comes out of this death of God will be a community that is able to tarry with the lack able to bring the lack into themselves, able to uh, not run from that, but rather kind of produce something good out of it. Okay, we'll leave it there. Um, and I will see you uh, next week if you're watching live or uh, in five minutes if you are watching after the fact and want to jump straight into the next, the next week. Take care. Bye-bye.